incredibly self-conscious right now going on after Amy Cuddy. <laughs> so I'm going to be doing interesting moves to keep things interesting here. Well, I'm delighted to be here with all of you this afternoon. This is one of my favorite topics. It's kind of geeky, but it really is a fun thing to really think about. So before we get started, I'll tell you a little bit about ROI, ROI Communication. We are a consulting firm, and we basically help companies navigate modern business challenges, whether it's strategy, helping CEOs communicate their vision and goals, whether it's um, people, so anything in the realm of HR or diversity or processes, helping people and companies understand what to do when, how IT works, how um, safety works, all the you know day-to-day -day things you have to do within a company, um, we help. So what we do is we really solve business challenges through three key areas. The first is what we call change enablement, which is about shifting mindsets. The second is communication strategy and execution, which is about driving engagement. And the third is communication ecosystems, and that's about optimizing experiences. That includes things like, what is your technology? What are your core capabilities? What are your channels and vehicles? How does that all work? We've been in business for 21 years. We became an employee-owned company a year and a half ago, so we've put our money where our mouth is, and so our, um, all of our employees own the company, and we are um, officially a um, majority women-owned company as well. We've been fortunate in our 21 years to work with well over 250 companies, and these are a few of our current clients that we are working with right now. So with that, let's talk about something fun. So I'd like to see by a show of hands of this list, what do you think was the number one grossing movie of 2022? Who thinks it was Top Gun? Okay, about half of you. Jurassic World, Doctor Strange. Ah, we have a fan over there. <laughs> Everything, everywhere, all at once. Few hands. Avatar. Well, those Avatar voters are right. Avatar was the number one. It brought in $2.3 billion. It's now the fourth biggest grossing movie of all time. Of course, number one was the first Avatar movie. Um, and it really blew everything else out of the water. So, wow, that was great. But what would you say was the best movie of 2022? <laughs> How many thinks it was Avatar? One person, oh no, two people, <laughs> three. How many think it was Top Gun? How about Everything Everywhere All at Once? Oh, majority there. Well, Everything Everywhere All at Once won the most awards. It won Best Picture in the Academy Awards. It won Best Picture in many different places. It won seven Oscar wins, one of the most of all time. But those of you who picked uh, Top Gun, that was a fan favorite. 99% and Rotten Tomatoes picked it as an excellent movie. So it brings the question of, what was the most successful movie? Is it how much money it brings in? Is it how many awards it wins? Is it how many people like it? It depends on who you are, right? If you are an actor or the director and you won an Academy Award, you'd say everything everywhere all at once. If you're an executive producer and this is a business and everything's about the return on investment, you would say Avatar. And maybe if you're Tom Cruise and you're at the point in your career where you just want to be popular and have everyone love you, <laughs> it's Top Gun. So that brings the question for all of us as we think about our jobs and our work, what matters? What is it we are measuring? What does success look like? And that's something we need to be asking ourselves all the time because other functions besides communication have a lot of standard metrics that they use to measure their work. Yet in communication, we often do not. Um, there are some things, and I'll be talking you know, a little bit about things like access, 
hits, page views, things like that. Um, but is that fundamentally what success really is about? Uh, fundamentally not. But a lot of these metrics are things that we also need to pay attention to because communication is often the driving force to make these things happen. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the uh, famous retail magnet, John Wanamaker, and he famously said, I know that half the money I spend on advertising is waste. The trouble is I don't know which half, <laughs> so I have to spend it all. And that's really where measurement comes in. So I'm gonna give you a little um, scenario that um, this happened about 15 years ago. So Cedar sinai Hospital, a very famous hospital in Los Angeles, realized that they were having an issue with doctors washing their hands regularly. And this is something that's measured uh, many hospitals, and you'd be shocked to know, I looked it up, that the average hospital, if they measure it, only 35 to 70% of the time do doctors wash their hands when they should. Pretty shocking. Well, Cedar sinai found 65% of their doctors were sanitizing their hands when they should. And so they said, we have to fix this. So they created a posse of observers trying to really track when people were doing it. And they said, let's do a communication campaign. We're gonna put posters up and we're going to send emails and we're gonna do all the things we normally do in communication to say, we gotta do something different. So they did that. Posters everywhere, you know, it was really in people's faces. Um, what do you think happened? What, by a show of hands, how many people think um, it, things improved by 10%? How about 20%? Well, the answer is zero. <laughs> it had no effect whatsoever. So normally in our businesses, we have a campaign. You're told, hey, let's, put, let's send out the emails. Let's put up the posters. And we say, we're done. We're done. But when you're really trying to change human behavior, you can't say we're done. You have to say, okay, that didn't work. What are we gonna try next? So they thought, let's try rewards. So if anyone is caught watching their hands, this posse of observers were able to just give a gift card to the doctor to say, hey, good job, here's a gift card. So how many of you think that had an effect? on changing the behavior. Okay, a few of you. How about, um, what do you think, 10% impact? 15%, 20%? Nobody thinks 20%, you're right. It did have an impact, it went up 15%. So they got 80% of them to do it. Um, but the goal was 90%, so they're still short. And they thought, what are we gonna do? How are we going to change this? So the team that was working at it were having lunch one day, and one of the doctors had the idea of, I wonder what is on our hands? And so they actually took a kit and put their hands in the agar, and they grew it. They cultured what were on people's hands after lunch. And they were shocked. It was quite disgusting. It was everybody's hands were covered with bacteria and they, it was very visible. So they took those images and they made screensavers and they put it all over the hospital <laughs> and they just put it in everyone's face. What effect do you think this had? It had a big effect, it went to 100%, right? Because. You know, my hand looks clean. I just washed it before this uh, session, but we all know now I'm touching this thing and I probably shook some hands and there you go. Um, so that really had a huge impact. And I think this is just a great story because again, most of us would have stopped at the very first step. We wouldn't have even known that what we were trying to do had no effect, right? We, we were told to do an email and we wrote the email, we pressed send and it went success, but, but really not. But when you think of the bigger picture, okay, we all know we want our doctors to wash their hands before they touch us, but it has a huge business impact because 
doctors and hospitals are actually graded on this. And it is public information. You can go on the internet and look at different grades from different hospitals. And my mother-in-law, who lives in the city, had a hip replacement surgery five years ago at a particular hospital. Everything went well, but then she'd heard they had MRSA infections and that things weren't going well. So she picked a different doctor in a different hospital to have her second surgery. So it really affected the business of that hospital. And a lot of people will, and I, in fact, going forward, I am going to make choices of which hospital I go to based on this. And in fact, hospitals with excellent patient ratings have higher returns. So the return on assets is much higher so that um, the big bar you can see there are those who have excellent um, patient results. The um, red color is moderate and the low one, the purple. Um, now you can argue a little bit, maybe it's chicken and egg, that hospitals with higher returns can spend more to create better patient experiences. And you know, there is something of that going on as well. But in fact, it is definitely a driver for business success. So you have to ask yourself, what, why, and with whom are you sharing data? So there are a lot of different ways to think about it. And you have to get into the mind, just as we were talking before about whether you're the executive producer or the actor or whoever you are, you care about different things. So that's true for the people you work with as well. So the CEO of your company and the leadership team may have a set of goals. You need to know what those are. You need to really understand those in a big way. Same thing for each of the business units that are in your organization. And there are a lot of different initiatives, IC projects, other things going on. What are we trying to accomplish? And then just how are your channels and vehicles working? Do you understand um, how successful they are? So those are all different things to keep in mind to really challenge yourself and make sure you know. So you need to start your measurement strategy with what leaders care about. And these are just some things leaders care about, right? Quality, market standing, customer satisfaction, productivity, brand reputation, productivity, innovation, right? There are a lot of things. But you have to know which ones are the ones we care about today and right now. And think about what is keeping these people up at night. So as you are trying to convince people of what it is you may want to do, it needs to be in their language, in their terms, about what they care about, not what you care about, in order to be effective and influential. And the same goes true with what you measure. So at ROI, we've developed something we call the five levels of measurement. And it becomes um, harder and harder as you go up the ladder to measure. So the first thing you measure is access usage. Did people get the information, right? Did they get the email? Did they open it? Did they read it? Did they attend the event? So it's, it's counting noses, right? People had some exposure to what it is that we did. The next level is now knowledge transfer. So it's still, you're, you're in people's heads. Are they thinking about something different? Did they learn something? Do they have a different opinion? Do they want to learn more? Are they curious? Right, you're, you're now getting to, they're thinking about what it is you told them. But the third one is the one we generally care the most about, is are they going to do anything different? If there's a deadline to enter your 401k, are they going to meet the deadline? If we are trying to change our culture to become more collaborative, are people collaborating better? Do they understand what that means? Are there feedback about what's going on within the organization? So these three are about measuring things at the individual level. As we move up the ladder, now we're getting to the organizational level, not just each person, but the cumulative effort of all the different people doing what they need to do. So this is now what's the business impact. So in the example I used before, the, the health grade of the hospital would be a way to measure the business impact of what's happening in an organization where you are trying to um, do an initiative of putting in a new IT system that will make things more efficient 
Are you more efficient now? Are people able to find information quicker? Things like that. When you are looking at the business impact on level four, we're talking about things like really identifying what are the goals, what are you trying to achieve, and understand what are the key performance indicators for those goals. Not the communication metrics, but back to what it is the company is trying to do. If it's a safety campaign, are you trying to reach zero incidents in a month, for example? So understanding what is the goal of what our campaign is. And find out who owns those metrics and talk to them and get a better understanding of what affects those metrics. How can you do things to actually help people understand and learn what they can be doing differently? And then you say, okay, how, what can I do from a communication point of view to improve these things? So if in the safety example, um, an oil company we work with does things like they have signage and reminders. They don't want people running on the staircase. They don't want accidents to have people running and falling. So do you understand how do you remind people? Well, maybe you have signage in the staircase. So like when they go in, there's like a just-in-time reminder as opposed to like an email when they're not thinking about it. So you, you start thinking about how can I affect the behavior? What can I do from a communication point of view to drive the behavior we want? And then quantify and try to understand what communication may have done to drive those things. Okay, the fifth level is financial impact because after all, most of us are working for companies that are trying to make a profit and increase revenue, reduce costs. How did this impact the bottom line? So did we make more money? Did we save money? Are we more effective? Are we more efficient? These are harder things to measure because communication is just one piece of what contributes to all of it, right? It, it, there's never just one group. It's a cumulative thing. But if you don't keep an eye on that, then you won't really be focused on doing the right things. So let me talk a little bit about um, productivity. That is a hot topic right now with many, many CEOs and companies especially because of the new work arrangements that many of us have due to the pandemic. So people used to know everyone was in their seat five days a week, all day long. We understood how people interacted with each other. And now all of a sudden, some people are in the office, some people live in Montana, some people are um, you know, home all the time, lots of hybrid, a lot of studies going on right now to understand that. In fact, I got a message today from a partner we work with and they're going to do a study to look at networking relationships and how that is different based upon different work situations, which is pretty interesting. So one of the things that drives productivity is how much time people are able to focus. Focus is the key to performance, by the way. And so you want to maximize the amount of time people have to focus on their tasks at hand. So this was a study done looking at how people were spending their time every hour of the day. And what you can see is the bottom color teal is focus minutes. The middle is collaboration time. So that's time spent in meetings or on phone calls, interacting with other people. And the top one, the red, is multitasking time. And while I, I pride myself on being a multitasker, I'm sure many of you do too, in fact, a lot of that is wasted time. You get distracted, you are going from one thing to another, you don't really accomplish very much. In general, you want to reduce multitasking time and increase focus time. And what they found in looking at um, thousands of people that roughly 20% of the day is spent in this multitasking, inefficient way of operating. So what can be done about that? Well, we recently just worked with a biotech company and they wanted to um, look at this as well. And the reason is that they grew like crazy in the last few years. They went from 3,000 employees to 5,000 employees in two years. They went from one product line to five product lines. And what ended up happening was from, this is what it looked like in 2021. So these are in an average week, 
how much information or events, time, were being consumed by employees to take in information that was being sent to them. So if everybody read and attended everything asked of them, it was about 2.9 hours a week. Well, by 2023, doing the same analysis, it went to 7.2 hours, 148% increase, because from one product line, now you have five product lines, and everybody's sending messages to everybody else, and everybody, and you all know this, everybody thinks their program is the most important program in the whole company, and everyone needs to know about it. So this is what we were getting, was now there's this long list of things. Now people still need to get their jobs done, we want them to be efficient, we want them to be in that focus time, and so the employee communication team here really raised the red flag and said, we have a disaster on our hands if we keep going this way. We cannot continue to inundate because in fact, our ability to create content far outstrips employees' ability to take it in. And so you have to be very careful about what you send, how you send it, how you present it, is it bundled? Is it prioritized? Is it a push versus a pull? Figuring out all of those things makes a tremendous difference in the value add that you have in employee communication for taking people's time well and efficiently. And so what they did was they went back to what I've been talking about is understanding what is most critical to the company. So really being clear about what the priorities were and saying, okay, things that relate to those priorities are things that can go to every employee. But things that don't, that fall below that line, we have to figure out a different way of getting it. Maybe it only goes to a segment of the population. Maybe it's on the intranet and people can pull it if they want, but we're not gonna push it to them. They also established a digital employee experience and a whole IC measurement toolkit to help them really be clear about why all this information was going out and what they were trying to achieve with it. And finally, putting in governance. That is so important to have a governance structure for how communication happens within the organization. And what that means is understanding who can send information, how it gets sent, all of the um, understanding of even you know, style, everything related to how communication takes place in the company, being clear about that and setting that up properly from the get-go, and that's made a tremendous difference in how they operate. Another thing that matters a lot, um, I'd love to hear by, see by a show of hands, how many of you have companies where innovation is something that you are focusing on? A lot of you. Yeah, I mean, innovation is what makes companies successful. New ideas, new products, new ways of doing things, that's how you beat the competition, and in fact, the profitability and growth of companies are very highly correlated with new ideas. So having a culture of ideation, of a company where people are encouraged to come up with ideas, have an easy way of submitting their ideas, having them reviewed and having action taken upon them makes a tremendous difference. And what you can see in this chart here, those red dots are the companies that had very few ideas and they actually shrunk. They were, became less profitable and grew less over time versus the ones that had lots of ideas. And that propelled success within the organization. So there's no question that innovation makes a difference. But here, I'm gonna flip the script a moment because in general, it's easy for us to measure at the lower level of our model where we talked about access and usage level one and level two. Um, here we know at the high level, super important, but what is it that are the drivers at the individual level that can create that kind of innovative success, that culture of innovation? So first you have to think about how do we measure innovation? Because you can measure it. And this is from a client that we work with who has an innovation software system that basically they will put a challenge out there Someone, someone in some part of the business might have a problem and they put out there a challenge and any employee can respond with their idea and other people can vote on their ideas or elaborate on their ideas, build on it. So in this case, they looked at how many innovation challenges, so how many ideas were thrown out to people to try to solve 
how many people and ideas came out of it and how many ideas actually get through the whole process. Because sometimes you put in these systems, but if leadership is just doing it to be fun and friendly, but they don't really build it into how they manage the company, then it actually will have a negative impact. People will stop sharing any ideas. So really understanding how many actually get through. So that helps you get to what the ideation rate is. So that's the number of ideas implemented divided by the number of active users in the system. That's how they um, were calculating it. So then we said, OK, how do we increase the ideation rate? What are the things we can control to do that? So more participants, right? The more people you have putting out ideas, the more ideas you're likely to get. How frequent are people putting out ideas? Are they doing it every day, every week, once a year? So you want to remind people as often as you can. Engagement, how many people are involved? How many people, maybe there are a lot of people who aren't the idea generating kind of people, but they're the evaluating and they're analytical and they like to think about, that's a good idea, that's not a good idea, right? But that's okay too, because their head is in the game. And then diversity, having as many different kinds of people involved also yields to more and better ideas. So if, that, if these are the drivers of ideation, which drives innovation, what can IC do to help make that happen? And strong IC really sets the stage for innovation. So there's something called the Employee Innovation Potential Scale. And this is um, broken down into four factors. And these are all things that we can drive from a communication point of view. Right, so the first one is, does the employees have insight into the company problems and their causes? So a lot of times I think companies like to put on a happy face and say everything's great and the future is good, but that doesn't do a lot of good in solving problems if that's the way you are acting. So is part of your job to say, boy, that business is inefficient. What can we do to fix it? really being open about problems and inviting people to help you solve them. Do the employees have interest in company improvements? Do people get recognized, rewarded? Are they heroes? Is it something that is discussed, like this is something that's really important to us in our company? That really influences it. So how do you cover that type of behavior? Does, do the employees think the company cares, right? Are we showing in the things we're talking about that people who, or, or do leaders take credit for other people's ideas and claim it for themselves? So you know, there are things we can do to really highlight. And then finally, if I have an idea, is it easy for me to communicate it? How do I let people know? Am I in a bureaucracy and there are you know, so many levels I'd have to go through to even talk to anybody? Um, or can I get online, submit something, boom, boom, boom. It's so easy, it's visible. So, you know, thinking about just how that works makes a tremendous difference. Have any of you heard of the Microsoft Garage? The Microsoft Garage is basically an innovative physical place. They have over a dozen of them around the world. They just opened one in Atlanta a few weeks ago. They have one in Kenya. Um, they're all over the world. And this actually came out of employee communication, this important driver of innovation for Microsoft. What happened was they were doing town halls at Microsoft, and the employee communication team was just very frustrated by the lack of engagement and interest and attendance in those meetings. And they said, this isn't good. We have to do something different. How do we really draw the employees in, and there you have you know, lots of engineers and coders and people who like to solve problems. So they had the idea of let's do a hackathon. And many of you may have heard of hackathons probably. It's where a problem gets thrown out and people from anywhere in the company can work together to solve it. So they actually kind of flipped the script because a lot of these town halls are right, someone from the top giving all the information and people are listening. And here they said, hey, these are different problems. I want everyone to work to solve it. And it became so successful in so many things 
that our Microsoft products and innovations have come out of this, that they then um, created these garage concepts uh, that they have around the world. And that was employee communication driving it, basically through um, the engagement measurement. So with that, I just want to close by saying how much power we have. Um, Amy Cuddy was talking about power. We have a lot of power. Um, measurement allows you to hold a mirror up to the organization, to show the organization how it's functioning. Even if you don't control things like managers aren't communicating enough, but if you can show through an upward feedback process or other things that you can put in place and really show these are things we need to address, you have amazing influence and power to make things happen. So with that, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Question. Oh, I'll come to you with the mic. Hi, Erin uh, Maggie. I work at DHL Supply Chain. Um, so you were talking about feedback. What are some creative ways that you guys have solicited feedback with some of your clients? More than surveys, more than you know, meeting and focus groups. Just curious. So feedback from associates or leaders oh, about what's going on. Um, well, the, the main things are surveys. You don't have to always do an all employee survey. So a lot of companies will do very small samples on different things. And sometimes it's just like one or two questions you can put on the internet and let people answer it. Because a lot of companies say, hey, we can't do another survey. So there are a lot of different ways of getting questions like that in there. Um, Interviews, so being able to just have one-on-one -on -one conversations of people in different parts of the organization is a way to do it. Um, having different instruments that become part of the performance management system is also a way of, of doing that. So there are things like upward feedback kinds of things where you get feedback on how they think things are going and so it's not just they're getting feedback, but they have this very formalized way of giving feedback. How, how would you recommend measuring when we're trying to change behavior with communications? For example, this is a little specific, but we work in legal and compliance. Yeah. So we do campaigns across the globe and across our TVs in the break rooms, you know, our homepage portal, email from the SECO or someone, but how do we measure, we can measure click rates and use like activity, and they always wanna know, our, our senior leader, how do we know it's effective? How do we know it's effective? You know, that's pretty specific, but other people probably have amorphous mm -hmm. messages, and then how can we say, that worked, that didn't work? I'm so glad you asked that question, because we work with a client in legal and compliance on exactly that issue. And this is, I think it's brilliant what, um, what we do with them. And that is, there is an annual, I don't know if you do this, but each year employees have to fill out a compliance kind of test. So there is a test that everyone has to take every year on their understanding of what all the rules and things they're supposed to be doing are. And what we actually do for this client is we take all the data from all their employees, and this is a big company with tens of thousands of employees, and we're able to then break it down and show in Japan, this is what's happening. In, you know, you can actually see how are the employees doing on the test, and what are the areas where they're doing the worst. And it actually ends up being different by location or by function. And so we then create reports to be able to show where are the weaknesses everywhere around the world. And then that basically helps the communication and the training teams know what do we need to target? What do we need to focus on in each of those areas? So it's not one size fits all. It ends up being very different depending upon where you are. You're welcome. Okay, hi. 
Uh, <laughs> sorry. I, I was thinking back to the example that you shared about the hospital and the hand washing with the doctors. And I feel like we all probably have a lot of examples of things like that that come up and they're, they're almost short term. And you reach that goal, which is really exciting. But what happens a year later? Or, um, you know, d those screen savers become kind of wallpaper and people don't pay attention to them. What's your advice for those types of campaigns and how do we, how do we stay with that and keep it where it needs to be? Um, that, that's such a great point that, yes, you, it, it's easy to declare victory prematurely when, when you know, it, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So that, again, is where measurement comes in. So you need to not say, okay, we're at 100% and let's stop looking. You need to say, okay, we have to keep our eye on this. And when it starts declining a little bit, let's not wait till it's 65%, but if it went from 100 to 95 to 90, now we know we, we have to do something differently. So I think it's about continuing to measure and challenging ourselves with, okay, what's going to work? What will, you know, it, get people to do it. And certainly something like this, every hospital in the world has this. So do we benchmark? Do we then say, okay, which, you know, go to the website I was talking about, which of the hospitals have the best scores? Maybe we reach out to those hospitals and say, what are you doing? How are you keeping your numbers up? And there's nothing wrong with imitating um, best practices around these kinds of things. But, but to your point, that is why we have to always measure what's most important and not declare victory too soon. Hi, um, we're a pork processing facility, so we have team members from over 30 different countries. And for all of our written communications, we translate it. Um, and we also do verbal translations, but have you seen differences in how cultures perceive different comms and like preferences? Great question, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the interesting thing is we have a company and we have a company culture and we want that company culture to be the same wherever we are. But the reality is we are all different. You know, even in the US, there's a difference between different regions, but certainly other countries are very different. I remember many years ago when I was working for a high tech firm and I flew to Malaysia and Japan and Singapore and walking around the office, I felt like I was back in California. Um, everything felt the same, people interacted with each other the same. But if you went below the surface, there are differences, right? In Asia, things were very much more hierarchical than they were in California. And that's the reality of how people are used to functioning in businesses in that part of the world. And so you have to understand that and, and work around it. We did a project a few years ago um, helping a company, they wanted to come up with an employee value proposition that would work for employees everywhere in the world. So we did focus groups. We, had, we came up with a lot of concepts. And interestingly enough, the concept of do you talk about the employee value proposition with I language or with we language? It depended on where you were. Um, in Europe, they preferred I language. In Asia, they preferred we language. In North America, it was actually a mix. It also depended upon demographics. People, longer tenured people within a company are we. They prefer we language. Younger people, people earlier in their career, it's all about me. It's I language. So, being able to understand even those kinds of nuances. And then, and so then my question to them was, okay, there's diversity and some disparities here. What is most important to you? Where in the world are you trying to attract the most talent and retain the talent or have a problem with retention currently? So it's, you know, you have to think about where are our priorities and then choose the solution that best matches what you're trying to achieve.